Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. Stock markets are under pressure across the world after two big financial stocks collapse. Shares of major Silicon Valley bank <clears throat> plunged 60% after booking steep losses to its securities portfolio. Cryptocurrencies melt after a major lender called Silvergate decides to shut operations. Global jitters rock the Lal Street. The Sensex loses nearly 700 points. Nifty down 170. Bank stocks take it on the chin. Sensex and the Nifty have lost over a percent this week. HUL appoints Rohit Java as MD and CEO for five years with effect from the 27th of June. Currently serving as Unilever's Chief Transformation Officer, the 57-year-old Java will succeed Sanjeev Mehta, who will retire after a decade at the helm. Market regulator SEBI proposes that mutual funds trade through their own terminals or foot-broking expensive. Sources say the proposal is still at a discussion stage. Asset management companies are protesting as this move would hit their profit margins. That's a money control exclusive. The first IPO from the Tata stable in close to two decades is coming soon. Tata Technologies files its IPO papers with SEBI. The IPO would see parent Tata Motors and others offload over 23% stake. India and the U.S. sign a memorandum of understanding to establish a collaborative mechanism on semiconductor supply chain resilience and diversification. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo had told CNBC TV 18 yesterday that she saw great synergies with India on chip design and technology. The Tamil Nadu government will reintroduce its bill to ban online gambling. Governor Ravi had returned the first bill. Reports suggest the governor had believed the House did not have the legislative competence to pass the bill. Xi Jinping secures an unprecedented third term as the president from China's largely ceremonial parliament, which voted unanimously for the 69-year-old leader. She was also named as the commander of the two million strong People's Liberation Army. Russian missiles found Ukraine reportedly damaging critical infrastructure and residential buildings in 10 regions. Ukraine claims to have shot down 34 cruise missiles and four drones. Facebook's parent company Meta is hashing out a plan to build a standalone text-based app that can rival Twitter. The move comes at a time when Twitter is struggling to maintain its user base due to the chaos under the new owner Elon Musk. That's a money control exclusive. Well, all of that and more is coming up for you, but let's start with the global market sell-off. Stocks under pressure across the world with two big financial stocks in the U.S. taking a beating. Add to this the comments from the Fed Chair Jerome Powell earlier this week warning about faster and higher rate hikes. All these factors are roiling sentiment across the markets. Rima standing by now to take us through the global market snapshot. Rima, not looking good. No, absolutely not. In the Asian market picture, you had Hang Seng down 3%. The Korean markets dragged lower by 1%. The Hang Seng was, uh, Chinese markets down nearly a percent and a half. Well, there were two key events which took place, two financial accidents. The first one is SVB Financial, which is the parent company of a Silicon Valley bank, which largely banks tech startups. And SVB Financial plunged 60% yesterday. This is the lowest level that the stock is now trading in since September of 2016. The second big event was Silvergate Capital. And this is a US crypto focused bank, which saw a decline of 42%. As they said, that we are voluntarily winding down operations and we are also going to liquidate. So these were the two big events uh, which took place yesterday. And this caused a ripple effect across the rest of the financial space. So take, a st take stock of the banking stocks. KBDW. This is the banking index. It's a benchmark banking index. It holds about 24 of the financial stocks and it was down 7%. The steepest drop that we've seen in financials since June of 2020. What is the market worried about? The market is partially worried about potential losses in the huge bond portfolios held by other US banks as the interest rates have gone up. And they're also worried that the frothy corners of the market, the tech and the crypto space, could come under pressure. Remember, the SVB uh, financial caters to the tech startups, while Silvergate caters to the cryptos. And these are the two frothy areas in the market. Let me also point out a tweet which came in from Uday Kotak of Kotak Mahindra Bank. And he says the overnight developments in the US banking system. Analysts, investors underestimate the importance of financial stability for the balance sheet of a bank. 
when interest rates move up by 500 basis points from zero in one year. An accident was waiting to happen somewhere. And that's what we had, two financial accidents. Let's see how this plays out. But the other worry in the market or the anxiety, some amount of jitteriness is ahead of the non-farm payroll data. Now, this comes out in India time, 7 p.m. Remember, January was a sizzling hot number. The market was expecting a number of 200,000. And what did we get in the month of January? A figure of more than 500,000. And the jobs data has beaten market expectations for 10 straight months, the longest run since 1997, which basically means that the market, the economists have been underestimating the resilience and strength of the US labor market. So today's February jobs data is going to be a crucial feeder into the FOMC meeting, which is scheduled to take place from the 21st to this 22nd of March. Back to you. All right, Rima, many thanks for joining us. As Rima was pointing out, global jitters, they're rocking the Lal Street also, with the Sensex losing nearly 700 points. And Nifty was down over 170. Bank stocks saw major cuts as investors turned cautious, with the bank index losing 2%. The Sensex and the Nifty have lost over a percent this week, with the Nifty Bank falling nearly 2%. So we'll be standing by to wrap up the day's trading action. Well, so we'll be down in the red today as well, and a percent lower for the week as well. Well, what a freaky Friday, not just on the Lal Street, but for markets around the world. It's almost like you prepare for the one important chapter in the book and the teacher decides to ask you something completely different. The reason I say that is that markets uh, in India were really prepared to look out for a lot of headlines on interest rate moves and you know, the future direction of U.S. monetary policy. It was all about the U.S. non-farm payrolls report, which comes out later this evening. But what we woke up to were headlines on the U.S. banking system, well, one specific bank uh, to be precise. So whatever's happening with Silicon Valley Bank has had a huge impact, and the risk-off sentiment played out not just on Wall Street, around Asia, and, of course, here in India as well. So uh, the net result was the market finally ended with a cut of about 1%. There was a lot of intense selling pressure. But the bulls will take that with both hands, and I'll tell you why. Because India has actually done better on a day like today than, than a lot of the other global markets. The Hong Kong market, for instance, was down about 3-odd percent. So the Nifty managed to pull back from the lows. It's ended close to the 200 DMA, put up a good fight. But the problem really was with the banks. The bank Nifty was down almost 2% throughout the session, and large names within the banking universe were falling like a pack of cards, Axis Bank, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank. There was some buying coming in at lower levels around the themes the market has been comfortable with in the recent past. There was uh, something on the consumer side, something on the auto side, stocks like Britannia, Titan, uh, and also some names on the power and capital goods side, uh, NTPC, Power Grid. That's where the buyers were gravitating, but otherwise it largely remained a completely risk-off day. Now, for the week, the Nifty has lost only 1%, which again isn't too bad looking at the way the headlines are shaping up. But one thing is extremely clear that for this market to even try and go back to the upper end of this range, the global headlines need to settle down. So it will be all about the way the, the U.S. jobs report uh, sort of comes in and the added news flow that we will get around the SVB crisis over the weekend. Yes, well, let's see what developments take shape. Uh, Sirbi, many thanks for joining us. On to a money control exclusive. Sources tell us that the Securities Exchange Board of India, that's SEBI, has proposed that mutual funds trade via their own trading terminals or by mutual funds fall outside the total expense ratio that they charge unit holders. However, the proposal is only at a discussion stage. Santosh Nair is standing by with the details. Santosh, what's being proposed and what does the industry have to say? Well, what the SEBI is uh, proposing, Shireen, is that uh, so far the broking charges which mutual funds used to pay when they buy or sell shares in their equity portfolio, that was outside the total expense ratio which uh, the mutual funds charge their unit holders. Now, what SEBI is saying is that this should become part of the total expense ratio, should be included within that. Uh, and one of the solutions or one of the options that SEBI has offered to mutual funds is that uh, to bring down the cost, they could perhaps take membership on the stock exchanges and do the trades through their own uh, terminals. Uh, this could bring down costs over the longer term, but uh, mutual funds understandably are not very happy about this. All right, Santosh, appreciate you joining us. At a proposal stage at this point in time, no final call taken just yet.
एफ एम सी जी मेजर हिंदुस्तान यूनिवर्स ऑल सेट फॉर अ चेंज ऑफ गार्ड रोहित जावा विल टेक ओवर एज एम डी एन सी ओ फॉर अ पीरियड ऑफ फाइव ईयर स्टार्टिंग द ट्वेंटी सेवन ऑफ जून एंड ही विल सक्सीड संजीव मेहता हु सेट टू रिटायर इन अप्रिल हैविंग सर्व एट द हेल्प ऑफ द कंपनी फॉर अ डेकेट शिल्पा रानी पेटा जॉइन जिस नाउ विद मोर डिटेल्स शिल्पा Uh, Sanjeev Mehta leaves behind a significant legacy 10 years at the helm tell us a little bit more about Rohit Jawa and uh, the shoes that he's going to have to fill Well from a management trainee to MD and CEO this is not the first time this story is playing out at India's largest consumer conglomerate like his predecessor Sanjeev Mehta Rohit Jawa who has been appointed the next MD and CEO of, of HUL has been with the Unilever group his entire career he started at HUL as a management trainee in 1988 and has risen through the ranks to serve as a chief of transformation for Unilever in London now he will join HUL on the 1st of April as CEO designate when Mehta retires and will be elevated to MD and CEO in June. Now he comes to HUL with extensive experience in the Asian markets having worked in India, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Philippines, Indonesia and China. Now Rohit takes over HUL remember at a crucial time. The company and the FMCG industry has been grappling with inflation with weak demand especially in rural markets. A recovery in demand and a resurgence in volumes will be key for HUL over the coming quarters even as the government indicates that there is a slowdown in urban discretionary spending now in addition forecasts of el nino are adding to the pressures as this phenomenon could derail rural recovery now java also has big shoes to fill as he takes over from sanjeev mehta who over the past decade mehta has driven growth pushing hul's turnover above a 50000 crore rupee mark under him hul's market cap also more than quadrupled from 17 billion dollars to 75 billion dollars now mehta has also been instrumental in kick starting hul's digital transformation and has spearheaded one of the largest mergers in the fmcg industry through the gsk consumer deal shilpa many thanks for joining us well it is uh, the end of a decade for sanjeev mehta Uh, heading HUL and it's over now to Rohit Jawa. The first IPO from the Tata stable in close to two decades is coming soon. Tata Technologies has filed its IPO papers with SEBI. The IPO will see parent Tata Motors and others offload over 23% stake. Sonia joins us now to get us a lowdown on the company. Sonia. Well, it's a big day for the Tata Group. Tata Motors, wholly owned subsidiary Tata Technologies, has filed a DRHP with the SEBI for an IPO. Now, this is important because this will be the first IPO from the Tata Group stable after 19 long years. The last one was way back in 2004 when TCS came out with its IPO. It also assumes importance as this is the first IPO from Tata Group under the tenure of N Chandra, who took over in 2017. Now Tata Technologies plans to sell up to 9 and a half crore shares which is a little under 24% of its paid up share capital. Let's talk a little bit about Tata Technologies itself. It's the IT services arm of Tata Motors catering to Jaguar Land Rover and Tata Motors products. The company provides a range of services including IT consultancy, SAP implementation and maintenance and design consultancy and has a very strong financial track record. Now the FY22 revenue growth was the strongest ever at 46% year on year and even if you look at the Nine months of FY23, the revenues of uh, Tata Technologies grew about 15%. Profits were up 23%. And if you map the margin profile over the last many years, you'll notice that the adjusted margins have increased from 16.5% in FY20 all the way to 19.2% in nine months of FY23. But what about Tata Motors shareholders? How do they benefit? The monetization of stake in Tata Technologies, of course, is a positive for Tata Motors. But the Tata Tech IPO, along with the receipts of consideration of the EV deal that Tata Motors did with TPG, will help reduce the company's debt. Tata Motors is now well on track to achieve zero debt on its India business versus about 12,000 crores debt as on December 2022. And with this IPO, we will now have three listed Tata Group uh, IT companies: TCS, Tata LXC, and now Tata Technologies. What are brokerages saying? Motilal Oswal put out a note where they said that they value about um, 25 to 47 rupees a share in Tata Motors for its stake in Tata Technologies. Back to you. 
Sonia, many thanks for joining us. Well, we told you, and today it is official, India and the U.S. have inked a crucial pact to build an alternate semiconductor supply chain. The Memorandum of Understanding will entail a collaborative mechanism on supply chain resiliency and diversification along with incentive programs. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo told CNBC TV18 that she saw great synergies with India on chip design and technology. We've been talking a great deal about semiconductors, and so... Uh, we will have a, f a formal discussion as between the U.S. government and the India government of India around semiconductors. How do we purposefully strategize and plan? India is home to a massive amount of uh, semiconductor design mm. talent. The United States uh, leads the world in semiconductor design. We have a <coughs> synergy there. One of the major outcomes of the commercial dialogue was the memorandum of understanding on establishing semiconductor supply chain and innovation partnership it will help us, both the US and India, in expanding mutual cooperation and ultimately ensuring resilience in the supply of semiconductors. Well, India and the U.S. inking an MOU for semiconductors. Time for us to head into a short break. But up next, Xi Jinping secures an unprecedented third term as China's president. What does it mean for companies in China? A special report from Beijing when we return. The proposed Digital India Bill aimed to replace the Information Technology Act is likely to revisit the need for safe harbour protection for intermediaries. The bill will also provide for moderation of fake news and will regulate algorithms and addictive technology. Ashmit joins us now with more details. Ashmit, uh, what should we expect? Well, the government is aiming for the monsoon session as far as this particular bill is concerned, so a tight deadline. And with that, there are four interesting takeaways in terms of what to expect. The first one is safe harbour protection. Currently, under Section 79 of the IT Act, it's very clear that there is safe harbour protection provided to intermediaries. There is a revisit of this safe harbour protection. The government is asking the question, is there really a need to protect intermediaries? That's the first key takeaway. The second is the concentration of gatekeeping powers in the hands of a few big tech players. The government is wary of the big tech players gaming the system and to that end will be introducing provisions uh, to check this concentration of power. In fact, this may even warrant uh, an amendment to the existing Competition Act. That's second. Third is the sheer scope of this Digital India Bill. It will cover everything from social media companies, e-commerce firms, uh, search engines, uh, gaming companies, telecom companies, OTT players and AI as well. And speaking of AI, which brings us to the fourth key takeaway, and this is uh, the DIA or the Digital India Act or Bill breaking new grounds. There are four key areas where there will be fresh ground broken by the Digital India Bill. The first is uh, regulation of uh, uh, AI. That is one key area that the bill will be focusing on. Another will be regulation of algorithms, algos used uh, by these big tech companies. That will also be brought under focus. The third key area is protecting minors against addictive technology. This has been a thrust area for the government to make internet uh, a safe space. And finally, uh, the need for ensuring uh, and a safe space in terms of having uh, an, a, an adjudicatory mechanism, an appellatory mechanism, whereby decisions of these big tech players can be challenged, can be appealed against. So these are four key areas, uh, big takeaways here as far as Digital India Bill is concerned. All right, uh, Ashmit, appreciate you joining us. Now, Xi Jinping has secured a... You know, many thanks for joining us, Xi Jinping, starting his third term. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. The news continues right after this.